I would say that New York uh, pop art, the thread that runs through it relates probably principally to advertising. Um, and I can defend that point, but I won't go into those details. Um, and my feeling about British and European pop art is that it is more related to popular culture. It also has a closer affinity to the art schools from which it arose, which were at that time, much more traditional than American um, art schools. And um, so I think there's a fiber in um, uh, European pop art of um, the sense of uh, an evolution of, of fine art. Um, whereas I feel the New York um, pop art is much more like a, 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 a guillotine coming down on um, its relationship to the the past uh, pop art. It's a personal opinion and um, something that would you know be worthy of lengthy discussion. I'm sure um, uh, you know back and forth. But I think I think there's a spirit in the New York that is very different than the spirit that was in Europe at the time. The British pop art, particularly, was tied to popular culture in all its uh, forms, uh, from popular entertainments to um, uh, to you know the pop art iconic uh, iconography that was coming out of the United States, um, then I think it was much more tied to popular culture as such. Um, and my work is tied to the film industry and a, a perspective through that kind of surrealism of film. So I mean, I have a foot in surrealism as well as a foot in pop art, I think. Um, well, I think I think artists get branded, um, and um, and sometimes they embrace the brand that is given to them. Um, I think as an artist, you work differently. You think, oh well, everybody is doing this, so I'm going to do that. Um, I want to find my my goal has always been to find a new original path to follow, something that no one else was doing, or something that um, or maybe a uh, uh, arose from the, um, the the common values or interests in art at the time, but then you know went off in a different direction. It's always important to me to to capture new territory. So um, I don't think you think, oh, what am I going to do next within the pop idiom? It's it's just not well. It's not the way I think. Um, and uh, so I don't think I threw my arms around pop. Um, if you look at the old lady, um, the first figure that I did. Um, uh, I don't know how you can say an old lady is pop art. Um, she's very closely tied to the, the tradition of um, sewing, um, quilt making, patchwork. She's closer to G's bend quilts than she is to pop art probably um, as a kind of mindset and tradition. If there is a cohesion in my work, it probably could be called pop art um, because it's popular culture largely. Um, is a donut pop art? Well, yes and no, <laughs> you know? So yeah, um, I'm, I'm neither constrained by it, nor do I, you know, I don't bulk at the title, but it probably like most artists, it doesn't always fit. Well, <laughs> as a Californian, you don't go to New York. <laughs> <laughs> you just don't. It's not. It's not your bailiwick. Um, you know, you might go to San Francisco within your state, or to LA if you were in San Francisco, or you might go up to Seattle or something, or to Mexico, but but not the East Coast so much. Not really. It, it was governed to a certain extent by the fact that my father was working on the film *The Longest Day* in Normandy, um, and as was his wont, anytime he went on location, he would say do you want to come to Fiji or Japan? <laughs> and usually I would turn it down. But on this occasion, I'd uh, skipped a year in high school and I'd done um, two years at UCLA. And it seemed like a good time to um, you know, go to Europe because I had just finished um, an art history course at UCLA um, that basically the textbook, everything in the textbook was, was in England um, or France. Um, and so the idea of actually seeing for real that which I had just studied was just mind boggling to me. And 
uh, you have to remember that California then was much more provincial, um, that, that really uh, it didn't have the kind of collector base, the gallery base and so forth that it now has. Um, and so, so it was like going to Mecca for me um, as a young art student. And um, uh, the Slade School of Fine Art when I left wasn't on my radar. Um, it was simply that I was gonna be going to France. Um, I was gonna enter France through the Second World War, which was uh, you know, commensurate with most of the rather surreal experiences I'd had um, in connection with my father's work. Um, so um, it was, in enormously funny and peculiar looking back on it because I I landed on the beaches of Normandy like the D-Day invasion you know I mean it was um bewildering I know more about that landing and um you know uh, Mons, the the, the uh, Pointe de Hoc and uh Port en Bessin and and all of all those you know sort of points in the in the second world war and so I went in through that and then you know just tromp the streets uh, of Paris when I got to Paris. And of course it was uh, the, the high time of the OAS uh, disturbances and plastiques. Um, so uh, all the French police had Tommy guns and it was a very strange atmosphere in Paris. So, um, but to me, I, I was unaware of that it was possibly marginally dangerous to be walking around in Paris. I didn't, that kind of went over my head. Um, and I just was loving every moment of it. Um, really, I left France um, at, in, at the end of uh, 61 um, and uh, to just have a quick visit to England before going back to UCLA. And um, literally the moment my foot hit the pavement uh, getting off the train, I just wanted to stay. And so, um, albeit in the middle of the year, uh, all the universities and everything, everybody was gone. I took the view that I probably could get into university because my grades were good. I had no idea that you had to apply a year in advance. Um, and I just pounded the pavements until somebody let me in basically. So the court hold and uh, the Slade um, uh, acquiesced to my wishes. And, uh, and I got into both those uh, institutions uh, as an external student or certificate student. So, um, and I just adored it. I mean, it was just so much food. It was a feast of culture. Um, London, one of the biggest, most impactful parts of it was the theater for me, being able to see both historical um, uh, pieces produced, um, but also contemporary works. Um, and uh, it, I mean, I, I, I thrived, I loved it. I was you know, developing so fast through my understandings and through what was available to me, it was just, Amazing. I married um, Peter Blake at 21. So, you know, I was sort of um, younger than the kind of first wave, well, the older pop artists, but, but of course that was Peter's social circle. So, so I suppose I transposed into that. Um, my immediate contemporaries, Colin Self and Anthony Donaldson and, um, uh, other painters in that that realm. Um, I was friends with them as well, socially and and otherwise. But um, I again, I think I think it's easy to think of a kind of collection of people that go to a pub and then they stand there talking about art. But the British are very weird about that. Um, a, they don't talk about their art. Um, they're not communicative in that way. If you got somebody to do a um, a paragraph exposition about what they were doing, it was considered slightly um, naff, slightly off, you know, it, the British just aren't like that, you know, they don't, they, they, at least those, the people I was with, they didn't expound on intellectual matters, it, that was considered kind of university. And that was a great puzzle to me, because I wasn't used to that. I was used to people, you know, having big arguments and rows and deep conversations and, and, you know, talking about books that they were passionate about and so forth, but it wasn't like that. Um, and um, I think occasionally there would be arguments about art itself. If you got near to Tony Cairo, Philip King and uh, the Coen brothers, that was much more vibrant 
punchy, but of course they were all abstract artists at, at that time. So the punchy ones were in that direction, Dick Smith. Um, the pop artists were, I don't know, they were much more, I, I suppose, hmm, how would you describe it? They, they were in the moment. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't like um, they wanted to share ideas and arguments and so forth. And, and I, I, I was more in a different kind of mindset, I think. Um, yeah. So yes, I mean, there was a, a camaraderie, but the camaraderie was not so much around art. It was more, more around what are you collecting, Portobello Road, going to the pub, um, watching Doctor Who, you know, it was that. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think I maybe was a fish out of my natural water. <laughs> Having said that, much of my early work skewed to be the form was fabric um, and cloth works. And um, the first notion of that really kind of was a, a moment on the top of a, a number 30 bus um, in front of Harrods as it was trundling along back to where I lived that I wanted to make flowers and I wanted the flowers to be represented as flowers, not as brass or, or plaster or wood. And I was working through, well, it's sculpture, so it should be wood, it should be soft, it should be these harder substances. And I suddenly thought, well, it, it, that's nonsense. It should be soft, it should be warm, it should be yielding a flower. It's like that. Um, and, and cloth just zoomed into my head. And I thought, well, <clears throat> because I have this huge knowledge of, of sewing, my mother taught me to sew when I was eight. Um, and I literally, most of the clothes in my wardrobe by the age of 10 or 11 were made by me. I, I knew a lot about form, um, how to take a two-dimensional piece of cloth and turn it into three-dimensional form. So I was really well versed in, in that area. And I thought, hey, you know what? I, you know, none of the guys are gonna know any of this stuff. I'm gonna go streaking past them, <laughs> you know, with this with these works because they'll they won't have a clue. And I was I'm naturally pretty competitive. And I think <clears throat> so the the idea of of um that that baseline um <clears throat> was there. But the thing that really interested me was um, the whole background that I had in terms of the film, um, because my dad would take me onto the, the sets to show me what he had most recently designed. So literally everything that he did in LA, I would go onto the sound stages and either see it in construction or when it was finished or actually when they were shooting a sequence. So that world of surrealism, that world where time is broken down, it made me completely fascinated with a time and b <clears throat> the 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 faux and i i think of hollywood as faux it's surrealist but it's it's pretend and so is art art is pretending to be a still life it's pretending to be a, a marble woman it's pretending to be all these things so this this substitution but skewed toward what i would call flicks art or movie art or and the label pop um so so i think um you know that just makes me laugh i i find it really humorous and i i also find it you know this wonderful shift in reality. So, so my father, you know, would would have something made out of plaster or a person made out of latex that would be lying around on the set. And and what's the difference between that and a figure that I make and I put in a setting? So to me, my work centers on the idea of the set, the substitute person, the the stand-in, um, the the soft figure, the, and the prop. So it's, you're going through there, the portrait, the nude, uh, the still life and, and the landscape, um, the setting in a town or something. So to me, it's absolutely parallel to, to fine art concerns. Um, and really that's, that's the area I've dwelled in, you know, since the sixties. I think I worked much more privately. Um, and certainly I, I was blind to certain things that I now understand about British culture better. Um, Post-war British culture still had much of the residue of 
the culture that preceded the, uh, the Second World War. Um, and um, for absolute sure, uh, women were not in as good a position as they were in California. Because, because of um, my experiences in California, I, I didn't see it. I didn't have the, the apparatus in my eye to be able to detect it in the way that I probably should have. Um, so I think um, I just, you know, I was very lucky personally. I can now see that. At the time, I thought this was, no, you know, what happened was normal and it really wasn't, um, you know, that, that women artists had a much tougher time and there were fewer of them that got good galleries and so forth. Um, and um, I was very young and had um, more success in London than probably I would have had in California for various reasons. Um, but um, I didn't recognize the, um, the gender divide for all its problems um, uh, at that time um, in England because I wasn't suffering from them, I didn't feel. Um, and um, I think the political situation, looking back, the people who took such wonderful, you know, responsibility for ban the bomb, anti-Vietnam um, War um, actions and so forth, my hat goes off to them for their um, vision, their insight, and putting themselves on the line, like the Greenham women and the marches to Trafalgar Square and so on and so forth. And um, I did still have some interest in American politics, but um, really the the people I was with um, were uh, to the side of that. I was probably the only one among them that watched the news regularly. I mean, there were great BBC programs like Tonight and um, things like that that kept me up to date with American politics as well as British. But I can't claim to be an activist at that time. I mean, my natural inclinations were, um, I mean, integration or um, you know, um, you know, all of all of the left wing things. I would have been left of left. I occupied a territory, but I can't say that that I beat the drum out on the streets in the way I have in the last decades. Because um, of people like um, Roland Penrose and Robert Fraser and Harold Cohen, um, I think I was spared <laughs> the, the full impact of, of what perhaps some of my fellow women painters would have experienced um, in that um, I gained access very quickly to um, the ICA um, when I was 20, uh, 20, yeah, just 20, um, and uh, was in a uh, an exhibition called Four Young Painters. And that arose out of uh, the Young Contemporaries show, which was a yearly show in London of student work, which was, I mean, there wasn't anything like that in LA. Maybe there was in New York, but I wasn't aware of anything like that for, for young um, you know, people, young artists straining at the bit. The year before I showed in the Young Contemporaries, um, David Hockney, uh, Derek Bosher, um, Alan Jones and uh, Peter Phillips showed. So that tells you the kind of the context of, of the Young Contemporaries. Um, and I, felt very lucky that I got into those things. Um, I was like one of four in the four young painters in that I was the only female. Then with the Robert Fraser gallery, it was just at the beginning, it was just Bridget Riley and myself and then a, a host of male painters, um, later Yoko Ono. Uh, and so, you know, one knew that that was the way it was. It's not so very different now. I mean, if you look at the lists in galleries, you'll see the percentage of women is so low uh, compared to the, the male painters that are represented. So the very area where you would expect the most avant-garde behavior, you have very conservative behavior because in a way there's a cap, there was a cap on the top in that the galleries were run by men museums run by men, um, arts councils and purchasing committees, largely male. 
Um, and um, word on the street or the way that, 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 that the thing that governed that was, well, you know, women, their prices are not the same. They don't, they don't show up in the auction houses at anything like the level that uh, male painters do. Well, what's changed? And for me, I mean, I was just one of the lucky fish that didn't get caught by the, the you know, prevailing you know, sort of atmosphere. Um, I slipped through on the inside um, somehow, um, possibly partly because I was um, a stranger in a way, which is a testimony to allowing differences, which I think the British do rather well. Um, but I, um, you know, I, I couldn't be placed in a class because of my accent being American. Um, so I don't know why I slipped through, but I did. At the time, the links for me were, were, you know, very kind of sequential in that I was in the Young Contemporaries and that gave me um, a traveling show with the Arts Council of a piece um, that traveled with other student work and then the ICA and this is 1962, um, 63. Um, I began, I, the first um, cloth works that I made were in the summer and fall of 1962 to get these pieces ready for the Young Contemporaries uh, submissions. Um, I was slapped down by Kenneth Tynan. Um, he, he wouldn't let my sculpture work in, but the painters let my paint, paintings into the Young Contemporaries um, exhibition. And uh, Robert Fraser, um, saw the ICA show um, and I guess I went on his mental checklist and then he offered me a show in um, uh, his gallery um, uh, in 64, 66. And um, then I showed again with him in 69. Um, I had connections with Madame Tussauds and uh, uh, Peter Gattaker and got a number of commissions from him that kind of were around the time of Sergeant Pepper. Um, and the connection with uh, the Beatles was quite early because the second concert I think they did in London, um, we were sort of drafted to take them round the, um, the London clubs. Um, so that connection and Sgt. Pepper followed with that. And, and just to put Sgt. Pepper in a context, it was one of, of several commissions that I was dealing with at that time. Um, and so in the zone of work, um, I was both, I was doing a little bit of teaching then and um, and also my own work and then also some commission work. So I was doing um, some work for my dad on a film called Half a Sixpence with Tommy Steele at exactly the time I was doing the Sgt. Pepper cover and, um, and then Tussauds commissions and um, then a, another commission that was for, um, uh, <laughs> a figure for Hugh Hefner's birthday, which I eventually turned down, um, and then um, uh, Expo. So there was a lot of things kind of happening with the art world. My zone of work was kind of, tra you know, traversing those kinds of areas. It meant that, you know, I knew I could make a nose um, as easily as I could make a shoulder. Um, and so the idea of, you know, the, the form, um, you know, that I had a form that, um, you know, really eliminated the competition because <laughs> I was good at it, um, really pleased me enormously. And I find that quite humorous, you know, I mean, it's both competitive and I'm also, you know, it makes me laugh at myself and at, at um, at the whole kind of posture of fine art, basically. Um, so I, I like that liberation. Um, and I, I don't, I mean, I, I don't feel that one needs to apologize for, for one's gender tendencies. I mean, I think it just, you know, increases the, the field of action. So it, it's not just being, you know, kind of, uh, a mean girl, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's something else. And I, you know, I felt that, you know, capturing a, a fresh territory as many other women artists did, you know, that you break the rules, you, you kind of, um, you say, yeah, well, just try to say this isn't art. I'm saying it's art, you know, this donut is art, <laughs> you know, suck it up, <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> um, so, I, and, 
And I think, you know, I, I, I would tend to laugh more than get peeved because, uh, you know, you haven't time to, to carry that weight on your back. I don't like dining on sour grapes. There's no point. Um, you, you know, if you're, if you're feeling angry about something, well, you do something about it that's constructive. Robert Fraser sold very well for me, um, both the shows that I had. He placed um, pieces in museums and in, um, in collections, um, but um, he, you know, he was extremely effective as a dealer. Um, and so I sold through the gallery. Um, I did some teaching. I did uh, a good many commissions um, <clears throat> and, um, and I, I sold a few works from directly from the studio, but mostly it went through the gallery. Um, yeah, I bumbled along and somehow, you know, one, one subsisted on, on that. And we, you know, we bought a, a railway station. It didn't cost much, but, um, you know, it, um, it, somehow we had enough money to do that. <laughs> so. I've, I've done Mae West several times and um, the, the idea there really is to, to turn the, um, the view away from the obvious members of celebrity. It would absolutely not be of any interest to me to do Marilyn Monroe um, or um, Elizabeth Taylor. Um, I wasn't interested in that that territory at all. That kind of celebrity based on beauty, based on you know all of that. Um, so, in the the idea of kind of turning the the view to a, a woman like Mae West, who is an intelligence and very humorous and not beautiful, and yet she she carried she carried it off. I mean, she was just amazing as a, a woman. That fascinated me. W. C. Fields is just hilarious and very surreal and, and nutty. Um, Shirley Temple, one can only apologize for one's um, indulgence at that point, but Shirley Temple was kind of there because um, W.C. Fields hated to have animals or children in his films because they upstaged him. And um, Mae West and W.C. Fields tried to work together on Way Out West, a film, and both of them wanted to dominate the film. So that was just, you know, lightning sparks between the two of them. So the idea of it being a dysfunctional family uh, just thrilled me. I <laughs> love the idea of the, the, the torture that they would impose on each other. <laughs> The, the objects of daily life really, I guess, are my segue into the still life, three-dimensional still lives. Um, and um, uh, as I mentioned before, I'm, I'm particularly interested in the, um, the relationship of the viewer to the, the piece that they're looking at. Um, there's uh, the, the first genesis of that is that if you're in a mixed exhibition as you expect to be when you're a, a fledgling art person, you kind of know, going back to competition, that you're going to have to create a piece that grabs the eye. If you create something that is larger than life, you've blown up your still life object, your bead or your donut or whatever it is, um, charm bracelet. Um, a, so you can see it. I mean, a charm bracelet, if I tried to make a, a charm bracelet sewing it, it would be impossible if it was that scale. Making it big makes sense. But it also does another thing that uh, I was aware of my father doing a set for, I can't remember what film it was, it's was a film with Gene Kelly, um, where Gene Kelly has to be a little person. So my dad makes a huge telephone and a huge pencil and a huge pad of paper, and Gene Kelly comes in and dances as if he's miniature. Um, now we would do it with CG, but it, it wasn't the case then. So if I make a giant charm bracelet that's nine feet long, you are made back into a child looking at it because you're just miniaturized in front of it. Um, so the relationship is is that it's about the film and about you know the change of the perspective of the of the viewer. So the beads um, were I I wanted to account for those beautiful. Is it called Millie Fleury? I think it's Millie Fleury where they, they, you stick all those beautiful little pieces of glass together. Um, and um, 
I just loved the, the design of that. And um, so I did a little drawing of it and then talked to my mother about it. And she was a printmaker around the printing uh, department at Central School of, of Fine Art. And um, so she said, yes, we can do this. And I said, well, I want to print it on the back of um, vinyl so that, um, you know, so that it really shines and it really looks like glass, but it's soft. Um, so um, we did that together and I, I did the designs for it and she did the printing. And I mean, it's a brilliant piece of printing. Um, and then I sewed them together and stuffed them. And, um, and the thing is that you then can really see the, the beauty of the Millie Fleury, the, the, the process that, you know, that is, um, but also, you know, it, it diminishes, it, it miniaturizes the, the viewer that these big beads are there. So it's just this funny relationship. Um. Shabam, pow, blow, whiz. 